Um, but uh, good morning and welcome to our second edition of Grand Rounds. Um, and just a note, our format is a little different today. Uh, if you notice, it looks just more like a regular Zoom meeting. Last week, in, last week we had the webinar set up. Uh, but with this, um, you can unmute yourself. Uh, the chats feature is enabled. Um, so uh, please, just as a reminder, um, if you're not speaking, um, do make sure you're just on mute so there's not any uh, background noise. Um, and then um, at the end, uh, we can all just try and ask questions um, and um, can help do that in an orderly fashion. Um, feel free to send out notes through chat um, if um, that's helpful too. Um, and um, you know, for today, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jeffrey Lotz. Um, he's well known to all of us, of course, but um, he uh, holds the um, David S. Bradford Chair um, and is um, our Vice Chair of Research for our department. Um, he's a national or international leader um, on um, low back pain um, and spine research. Um, and um, he uh, started um, or studied initially Cal, Stanford, uh, MIT, and Harvard, um, and has been with the UCSF department. Um, and he has really led a number of different centers as well, which I think has been uh, really instrumental in our uh, department's uh, research development. Uh, the CCMBM, which um, I think most of us are members of, uh, the C Doctor, um, and then also um, has uh, recently received. Um, you know, funding for the Backpack um, and UCSF REACH initiative, which is uh, really exciting and uh, will be a, um, you know, a great um, opportunity for our department. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Lotz, thank you so much for um, speaking to us today. I know we're all very excited um, about uh, your talk and um, these uh, future developments. Thank you, Drew. So, the, with uh, most of our research on pause because of the COVID situation, I thought I'd take an opportunity to talk about what's happening within the backpack program. There's actually quite a bit going on, so we've been very busy uh, with uh, getting this program rolling, so I thought it would be valuable for you to get an update on what backpack is and how our department is participating. So the backpack program is uh, under the umbrella of the HEAL initiative, which I'm sure you all know about. It stands for helping to end addiction long-term. It was uh, roughly $900 million in funding. It was allocated to target the opioid epidemic. Uh, there was broadly uh, 500 projects across uh, multiple institutes at NIH that were targeted uh, for this program. And within, within that program, there's a more focused effort on on back pain. It's uh, called the NIH Back Pain Research Consortium or nicknamed Backpack. And this was chosen as one of the uh, uh, focus within HEAL because obviously back pain is uh, a predominant form of pain. It's the most common non cancer reason for opioid pres prescription. Uh, there's, and despite that, there's a lot of unknowns. It's uh, complex. Most patients really don't ever understand why their back pain has. Uh, stricken them, so identifying appropriate treatments is hard. So the goal of the backpack program in general is to develop a better understanding of the biomechanical, excuse me, the biomedical mechanisms, and have this done within this biopsychosocial context, which I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, explore innovative technologies to uh, address back pain, and a more focused uh, effort within our center is developing the diagnostic algorithms and having those algorithms provide a platform for personalized therapies to better match patients to treatments. So the structure of uh, the backpack consortia is, is depicted here. There's a, this is funded through the Arthritis Institute at NIH. Uh, there's uh, a number of committees that have been assembled. Uh, there's uh, four different funding mechanisms. There's on the lower left, there's a data coordinating center. Uh, it's a U24. There's three mechanistic research centers, which are U19s. There's technology sites, which are focused on uh, developing and validating new, new uh, technologies that can be rolled into clinical cohorts. And then there's two phase two clinical trials. And I'll touch upon these briefly. The, the data coordinating center, which is uh, kind of an overarching operational structure is run out of the University of North Carolina, Lisa Lavange and uh, Anastasia Ivanova are the two PIs of that grant. And this 
group uh, is really largely devoting their time to developing infrastructure. Um, you know, there's a clinical data registry, uh, integration of our data, uh, helping with adaptive study design, biostatistics. Uh, they're going to be coordinating uh, algorithm development, validation. Uh, primarily, the lion's share of the work that they've been doing is on this operations side, and trying to get this uh, national consortia organized and uh, communicating effectively. And this has been a, a huge endeavor. Uh, this whole program started, uh, the funding began in uh, late last year, October, November timeframe. So we're still on the steep part of the curve here. <clears throat> so the, the mechanistic research centers are... Uh, are really goal, the goals are to build and deep phenotype uh, cohorts of adult, adults with chronic low back pain. Uh, and, and our goals are to determine the you know, response to treatment, heterogeneity of treatment effects, and then these algorithms to tailor treatments. There's three mechanistic research centers, one here at UCSF, one at the University of Pittsburgh that's led by uh, Gwen Sawa and Nam Vo, and one at the University of Michigan that's led by Dan Claw and Afton Hassett. And so these are, uh, you know, I think uh, central components of the consortia that are gonna be collecting data and the, the data that we'll be generating will be um, aggregated and funneled into this large algorithm development program. The uh, technology research sites uh, of which there's seven, to at UCSF, and these are, are kind of milestone-driven uh, programs to develop novel technologies that ultimately can be folded into the cohorts that uh, the mechanistic research centers are building. And you can see Aaron has one focused on implant biomarkers. Uh, there's another one that Sharmila has on quantitative MRI with deep learning. You can see some of the others here that are focused on sensors, uh, PET MRI, ultrasound and so these tech sites are uh, by milestone driven they they have targets they need to meet that allow them to transition from the uh2 to uh3 phase and and that transition occurs roughly in a year or two years depending on their specific uh, program now there's also two phase two clinical trials these are similar in the sense that they transition from the ug3 phase there's one focused on therapeutic virtual reality running out of cedars that Brennan Spiegel is leading. And then a second that's focused on antidepressants, a kind of combined antidepressant enhanced fear avoidance rehabilitation for back pain patients uh, with high negative affect. That's been run by uh, AJ Wasson from the University of Pittsburgh. So the, this uh, figure shows the this structure, these uh, steering committee and these working groups. And this has been um, I think for the majority of us, I know at UCSF and I think the other sites as well, a um, big burden that was probably not necessarily anticipated originally. Uh, you know, these are all uh, efforts that are going on, uh, you know, fairly aggressively with weekly meetings and discussions. And most of these working groups consist of faculty from across all their sites. So there's, you know, 15 to 30 people on these calls. And, and these working groups, uh, which were established by the Data Coordinating Center at NIH, are been the primary mechanism for us to uh, all uh, collectively start working together. And uh, it's a, been a huge time commitment. But I think it's the value of this has been there's a, a better awareness of what each site's strengths are, what our goals and uh, vision is for our research and developing ways to better integrate effort. And I'll talk about some of the specific things we're developing within these working groups uh, that uh, are, are kind of an active work product that, that's uh, currently underway. The, uh, the goals, as I mentioned, are harmonizing data elements. So as you can imagine, we have the three mechanistic research centers will be collecting uh, clinical data from these large cohorts and we hope to aggregate them. So there was, uh, there is ongoing a lot of work to uh, reach consensus over what data should be collected that's done in the same fashion at each site so, so that our data can be brought together <coughs> and, uh, you know, combination of uh, questionnaires and, and other types of data, which I'll describe in a minute. So that's been a, a huge effort. Uh, there's also been uh, work going on to help develop synergy on algorithm development 
And the hope with this, um, the, these uh, working groups is to better identify where there's gaps in the existing research that can then be um, a focus of targeted new dollars for what are called ancillary funding. So the data coordinating center at University of uh, North Carolina has additional money that's uh, held in reserve to support projects which are felt to be uh, not fully represented within the consortia. And I'll talk about a couple of those that we're going to be advancing. And then there's a plan for a collaborative interventional trial that will uh, theoretically start in two years. So things we've learned in the first two years on uh, phenotyping uh, back pain patients and how they might respond to treatment can be brought into a, a collaborative effort that will begin to test those algorithms. So this is something that's really going to pace us along because uh, obviously we have to learn a lot before that can start. And then the other feature of this program is that there's a hard stop in five years. So the money needs to be spent and what we don't spend, we have to give back. So there's, uh, there's not the opportunity to uh, carry over, although there may be some wiggle room given the COVID situation, but uh, uh, we have um, a fairly strict timeline that we need to follow. So the REACH um, organization, so REACH is uh, the acronym for our center, and all of these MRCs, the U19s, are core centers. So there's a, a core infrastructure which is meant to support a central research project. So this figure uh, depicts the uh, structure that, that we've uh, been developing. There's uh, the central cores that are the gray boxes in the center that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, which are focused on essentially the bricks and mortar of our center. What are the uh, infrastructural tools and technologies that we think are important for building our cohort and also conducting research? Uh, you can see we have a, a clinical core that uh, is working with UC Braid to link several UC hospital sites that will allow us to collect patient enroll, enroll patients more broadly across the UC system. There's an informatics, biobehavioral core, physical function, and biomechanics core, and a pathophysiology core. And what we've tried to do as much as we can is have these cores uh, synergize with existing groups at UCSF so that we're not uh, reinventing the wheel. We have linkages with uh, CTSI, for example, and uh, patient advisory group. We have linkages to our P30 uh, for you know, imaging. There's co-labs here that are going to help us with biosample analysis. Uh, our a metric program for functional analysis, uh, BACAR Computational Health Sciences Institute. So we, we uh, didn't want to start this de novo. And I think a real strength of our application was the infrastructure here at UCSF and, and our ability to, to leverage that towards this common goal. So the the biopsychosocial model has really been the kind of the uh, central feature that NIH has been advocating that we all adhere to. And this really means thinking about the whole patient and, uh, you know, not just looking for pain generators in the spine, but thinking about how patients, um, how they process pain, influence their uh, pain experience and, and how, uh, you know, loading more traditional, perhaps biomechanical factors contribute. And this will, as far as we know, the first time all of these will be comprehensively integrated into a single study. And, you know, I'm learning as we go through this process that there are, uh, particularly across the MRCs, different schools of thought as to the, you know, the root cause of back pain. Some are more interested in pain generators and thinking about nociceptive uh, stimuli, and others are really more focused on what's happening in patients' heads and, and that it's largely a psychological experience and not necessarily driven by a unique pain generator. So there's, uh, you know, these working groups, I think, have been valuable to help us explore, you know, where, where we all feel are the critical issues to address, but then to try to identify how we can integrate our, our data to capture all aspects of uh, potential risk factors and sources of pain in patients. The, the, so the cores are supporting a central research project, and these are the aims of our, our, our proposed goals. And these are evolving as we're learning from each of the other sites and through, uh, I think, pivoting a bit in terms, in terms of identifying or wrapping um, some of our efforts around new gaps and research. But 
generically, the first portion of our research project is to validate new data elements or measurements that we think are going to be important for more deeply phenotyping the cohort. And uh, so there's biobehavioral tools, uh, pathophysiology, imaging and blood sample analysis, biomarkers, movement analysis tools. And so these three aims are looking at those central components of the biopsychosocial model, making sure that we've got the best tools available that capture those domains that allow us to better uh, hopefully integrate those into a, a collective analysis. The, the second aim is thinking more about patient expectations and how can we better understand what uh, is, a, is a meaningful response to treatment, how we can better align patient expectations with the uh, care pathways. So that's the overall goal for AIM-2. And then obviously AIM-3, we, we have a large data analysis plan for as we're collecting these data, how do we combine those using the most advanced methods that are available to come up with predictive algorithms that uh, help us help us better align patients with effective treatments. So the, each of the components, the cores, I'll just walk through briefly who's involved and what overall we're, we're trying to achieve. So the administrative core is uh, you know, led by uh, those shown here. There's myself, there's Connor O'Neill, who's a co-PI with me, Desmond Coughlin, who's running operations, and we have two new members of the team, Jake Williams and Daniel Davis, who I don't unfortunately have pictures of, but we've been uh, you know, working to align all of our in, internal work, coordinate with this uh, the larger backpack consortia, and um, get our arms around the budget. Uh, you know, there have been some uh, Know, budget uh, hurdles we're overcoming to particularly adapt to um, the uh, working group recommendations for data elements and, and what measurements should be collected and how we're going to do that across all our sites and what cost is going to be associated with it. So there's still a lot happening there to try to get everything into alignment. Um, the technical cores uh, the, of which there's um, four, uh, this one is so this slide's focused on the biobehavioral core, which is looking at things that are happening in patients in the patient's head. Uh, the Wolf this is being led by Wolf Mailing and Irina Strigo. Uh, they're focused on thinking about measures of patients' pain experience. Uh, there, some of the uh, kind of domains that are listed here: catastrophizing, you know, anxiety, depression, coping, fear of pain. Some of the technologies that they're advancing include uh, a number of self-reports that are focused on uh, patients' pain experience. There's some quantitative sensory testing and profiling that will uh, be combined with some neural profiling with fMRI to uh, develop, kind of ask the question, can we develop a, a fingerprint for how patients uh, react to pain? Um, and hopefully there's some preliminary data that we uh, we're building on that identifies measurements that allow us to identify kind of these low and high pain responders, uh, somewhat linked to catastrophizing, but there's brain patterns in response to um, um, sensory input uh, that can help give us insight as to how patients process pain and that uh, then in turn their risk for addiction to opioids or in their um, tendency to move from acute to chronic pain. <clears throat> the uh, pathophysiology core is led by Aaron Fields and Roland Krug, and here there's a, a big em emphasis in quantitative imaging to uh, use, build on some of the advances that, that UCSF has led in identifying features in the spine that are linked to uh, chronic pain in clinical cohorts. Uh, some of the technologies are depicted here. There's a bone marrow composition, um, with uh, ideal or um, uh, the ideal MRI end plate with UTE. We'll also be looking at muscle quality, an vertebral disc. Uh, we have a, a plan also for analyzing biomarkers. Initially, we propose looking just at blood, but there's um, kind of growing interest across the consortia to expand uh, bio samples to include. Um, urine and stool and some other things. So we're, we're kind of working to uh, adapt some of those protocols. We'll be collaborating here with some UCSF 
just my program's BIOS for collecting the, and storing these samples and then CoLabs for doing sample analysis. <laughs> the uh, physical function core is being led by uh, Jeannie Bailey in collaboration with uh, Matt Smook from Stanford and Bill Maris from Ohio State University. And here the, the goal is to um, capture and deploy measures that allow us to assess uh, physical function, both for the assessment of, of disability, uh, but also to explore whether there are biomarker, movement biomarkers or activity biomarkers which anticipate a response to treatment. Uh, some of the examples of what we're, um, we'll be uh, deploying are shown here. Uh, Matt Smook is, is an expert at, at activity tracking using either wrist or waist worn sensors, and he has a broad experience in looking at patterns of motion in the active, during activities of daily living. So we'll have a cohort of our patients wearing these sensors to, to look at how their activity might relate to their response to treatment or their evolution or their symptoms over time. Uh, Bill Maris uh, is uh, over a number of years developed these uh, sensors for measuring trunk motion and relating trunk motion patterns to uh, disability and pain in occupational uh, cohorts. So he's uh, kind of bridging what he's learned from kind of the ergonomic area and uh, environmental uh, factors and, uh, you know, lifting and twisting and uh, uh, fatigue during work. Uh, and he has developed this device that patients can wear in the clinic and measure their movement during uh, kind of a video guided uh, set of activities. Uh, we've been working uh, in collaboration with physical therapy. This is uh, some work with Jeannie and Rob Matthew are doing, looking at depth mapping to measure total body motion and calculate forces and moments within joints. And primarily a sit to stand a assessment in the clinic is something that they've been focusing on. Uh, there's also, um, we have a, a digital cohort that I'll talk about in a minute that we'll be tracking using uh, the Eureka platform. And we hope to be able to collect uh, data from those subjects and uh, using smartphone apps is one potential opportunity there. The uh, bioinformatics core is uh, you know, assembling the, the tools and techniques for us to uh, deploy once we have new data. And as we're preparing for that work, we've been working with electronic health record data and other data sets to um, begin exploring hypotheses uh, in anticipation of data we'll be collecting. This group is shown here. Tom Peterson, who's a new member of our department, is directing that core. Atul Butte is his kind of wingman. They, uh, he was his mentor in the uh, Baycar Computational Center. Adam Ferguson is uh, in neurology. and He uh, has a lot of experience with uh, uh, data analytics uh, has, and also traumatic brain injury. And he's been a valuable member of this group. So they are, are actively working to uh, bring together the tools we'll need, uh, kind of shown depict, depicted schematically here with uh, machine learning, natural language processing, deep learning, uh, access to uh, uh, electronic health data, and then integrating measures we'll be collecting that are being supported by the cores in those various domains of the psychosocial model. And the goal here is that the analytics will really be the um, uh, you know, the effort that's going to allow us to make sense of the data we'll be collecting and aligning that with some of the goals for predictive analytics. Uh, because we're still building our, uh, getting the clinical studies uh, designed, and we hope to start those studies um, in late summer, uh, sp uh, spring, uh, or fall, excuse me, COVID uh, delays. You know, depending depending on on our start, uh, we we are developing uh, an infrastructure and starting to perform analyses that allow us to test some of our hypotheses with existing data. You know, mapping data elements we can collect from various sources to the data elements we plan to collect, uh, and thematically around some themes of. Uh, of factors and domains of back pain, and so some of those are shown here. So there's. Uh, you know, existing data from the health, electronic health record, both from UCSF and also the VA. There's uh, within those uh, a number of different data types we're starting to look at. And uh, the objectives are kind of shown here schematically of looking at some initial cross-sectional cross types analyses to identify clusters of patients. And then uh, if we 
have patients ac patient visits over time, we can do some kind of pseudo response to treatment analyses uh, given those existing data. So the clinical core is uh, probably where 80% of the work is being, has been done so far. And we have uh, this core being led uh, by this group, uh, Dennis Black, uh, Connor, uh, Tricia Hugh, and uh, Patricia Zhang. And Dennis and uh, Tricia are in the Department of Epi and Biostats, and they are part of the San Francisco Coordinating Center and have years and years of experience of, of running large clinical studies and so we're kind of in the good in good hands in terms of getting our cohorts off the ground and we have uh, uh, lots and lots of meetings to plan these two primary cohorts one we're calling the comeback cohort and and one called the back home cohort uh, the in addition to that group we have a, a, a steering committee uh, there's a, a coordinating center i mentioned which is uh, here at UCSF is going to be uh, aggregating and organizing our data. And then we have those four clinical sites that we'll be enrolling patients from. There's here at UCSF and then uh, three other UC hospitals. Uh, uh, Davis, Scott Fishman is uh, the PI there. Uh, San Diego, uh, Mark Wallace is leading that effort. And Mark is also the PI of an EpicNet hub and, and we're part of his hub and spoke model. So EpicNet is a infrastructure the NIH has established through HEAL to execute clinical trials. And so as some of the new uh, treatments um, start coming online, EpicNet is a mechanism for those treatments to um, uh, have uh, clinical cohorts. And uh, so we hope in the future to be running some of the clinical trials in collaboration with Mark for some of the novel therapies that will be coming up through HEAL. And then uh, UC Irvine, uh, Shalini Shah, who's a uh, Department of Pain Man Management and Anesthesiology. And anesthesiology. So we'll, our, our current plan is to have 100 patients at each site. And uh, these patients then are going to be all part of UC Health. So we'll have access to the electronic health record data, which would allow us to then aggregate measures we'll be collecting on those individuals with data that, that already exists for those individuals within the health record. So the details of our comeback cohort is this is going to be a, a longitudinal cohort, a total of 400 patients across those sites I just described, and we'll be collecting data uh, at six-month intervals for up to three years. Uh, and you know those data will be uh, kind of generically in the categories that are that are shown here, and I'll talk to, talk about that in a minute. And the back home cohort is going to be uh, a sightless. It's a digital cohort. We have uh, much higher aspirations there. We hope to have 5,000 subjects who will be uh, identified through, with help from CTSI through um, ICD-9-10 code searches through the electronic health record across uh, UC Health. And then those patients are invited to participate, uh, sign in to our, our website that we're developing with uh, Eureka. And, uh, and that website allows us to deploy questionnaires. Um, there's also a goal for us to have patients uh, participate in engagement or ancillary studies. And so we are in discussion with, with groups uh, like uh, Kaya who have apps for back pain. And that allows us to, uh, if we you know, randomize patients to these digital tools, that allows us to perform studies on their effectiveness and, and utility. So we're um, planning to use this digital platform for a number of additional ways to engage patients and study how important education, for example, is in uh, and patient teaching is in terms of their self-care. The, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have uh, these working groups that have been really pushing us along and in, in, uh, helping us make progress in advance of actually interacting with patients. And some of the bullet points are here I'll touch upon briefly. There's a lot of work that's uh, had to happen in terms of agreement around what data we're going to be collecting. And there's a, obviously a balance between how comprehensive we want to be versus what patients will tolerate. So the patient burden, um, yet, uh, you know, balancing that with our desire to be exhaustive is uh, been a, a real uh, point of discussion. Uh, there's obviously work in the, our clinical trial plan uh, and community engagement, patient advisory board efforts, 
uh, EHR data, uh, theoretical model, myofascial pain, and social determinants. I'll talk briefly about these because these are areas that we've been uh, kind of advancing the ball. So here's a list of some of the working groups that have focused on this issue of clinical data harmonization and, and the UCSF team that's been a part of those discussions. So we, in the beginning, in the, in the data coordinating center, I think has been helpful in this and making sure that there's representation across all of those committees and working groups of uh, individuals at each of the um, backpack sites. And this is you know, partly to help share the load, not overburden a small set of individuals, but also I think provides a, a way for us to get to know each other. And so these working groups and committees in particular have been important for shaping the, the consensus around what data we're gonna be collecting. And uh, so the minimum data set uh, you know, Connor and, and Tricia, uh, Sabell, and uh, they've been really active in the imaging, you know, uh, Aaron and Roland Krug, uh, Thomas Link, physical function biomechanics, uh, Jeannie's been a big part of uh, brain imaging, biospecimen collection, biobehavioral research, and the clinical management committee. And so these are just some examples of the kinds of data we'll be collecting that include uh, you know, traditional patient reported outcomes, but also biosamples. Uh, we're, we're collecting blood, as I mentioned, for uh, analysis of serum. Uh, there's a number of promise questionnaires that there's consensus around and biobehavioral questionnaires. And then there's also going to be a, a fair amount of quantitative testing here uh, is, is, is a, a list of that with a QST, uh, physical function assessments, uh, imaging, uh, which of I think we're probably performing uh, the majority of, although we're hoping to have some uh, overlap with uh, some of the other uh, mechanistic research centers. And then the electronic health record data. The, uh, you know, this is patient, meant to be patient centric. And so there's obviously an important component of this to have uh, the community representatives and patients engaged in helping us think about uh, issues of uh, communication with patients. Uh, so there's some front end discussion on designing our materials that will be for uh, recruitment and retention for, for both cohorts. Uh, we've been uh, developing that with uh, the group shown here, Sabelle, Patricia, Desba, Dennis, uh, myself, uh, Patricia and Connor have been involved as well. And working with Paula Fleischer and Tung Nguyen from the CTSI Community Engagement Group. And so they have a standing committee that includes representatives of um, various ethnic groups who uh, and patients of you know various um, of conditions who help us think about what is important for us to, to consider, and you know we're obviously sensitive to making sure our cohorts representative. So to the extent that we can be including diverse populations, uh, you know that's important. And so there's certain aspects we're trying to build in to maintain that. And there's obviously a, a component of retention that we're we're uh, sensitive to, and we want to follow these patients over a long period of time. You know, there's some particular COVID-related concerns we have in terms of how, you know, patients, um, their trust in kind of entering the system and getting back involved in these studies and how that's going to be influenced by our current uh, clinical disruption is an uncertainty that, uh, you know, this, hopefully this group can help us with, uh, you know, incentivize, incentivizing patients to participate. There's uh, also been a fair amount of work in trying to develop a, a kind of a unified theoretical model for back pain. And the model, um, you know, the goal here is to help us think about domains of, of risk that are based on uh, you know, current expert opinion or literature that allow us to look at what data we're collecting. Um, do those data fit within risk factor domains that are currently appreciated? Are there things that are missing that we should collect? And, and so this has been a tool for doing some course correction early on. It's also a tool to help us identify gaps in proposed research. So if we start thinking about proposal or the hypothesized uh, research that each of the sites has, if we look at those proposals through the lens of a, of a model, that also might help us identify gaps where some ancillary funding through the, the mechanistic, or excuse me, the, the data coordinating center could be targeted to, um, to address. So this has been a, an ongoing effort 
both within REACH and then across the consortia. And, and the goal here is to try to evolve um, you know, some graphical depictions of risk factors and how they uh, might be uh, you know, uh, measured for individual patients, uh, trying to use that as a tool to uh, match domains to measures we'll be collecting and then uh, use what we're calling use cases or hypotheses to uh, start to think about modeling techniques. And can we uh, begin to think about the approaches, computational, mathematical, or statistical, that we're going to be using to combine data and test hypotheses and think about fit, goodness of fit, things like that. So this is a, a kind of a work in progress. Uh, there's a, a NIH science writer who's developing an article will be published within HEAL, which will talk about this theoretical model is, I think, one of the early indicators of how the consortia is trying to get their, um, their goals aligned and, and us uh, kind of achieving some consensus around the goals of uh, the overall consortia. Uh, I mentioned there's these opportunities for uh, new research funded through the Data Coordinating Center. And so they're you know, very anxious in identifying gaps and how gaps could be addressed now that might help inform this uh, upcoming anticipated uh, collaborative interventional trial. And so there's two in particular that uh, we've been uh, advancing some ideas because they seem to be um, you know, resonating with NIH and the broader backpack community. One here is on myofascial pain. You know, the the, that as a topic uh, was not explicitly discussed and any of the proposals were funded. So there's an interest in NIH to uh, explore how we can address that. So our overall goals here are to look at some novel ways of functional imaging or identifying potential pain sources or triggers in and around the spine using uh, some example approaches we're exploring or quantitative MRI or T2 mapping. Uh, magnetic resonance elastography, ultrasound elastography, or low-dose PET CT. So our first goal is to do some uh, validation of those technologies uh, in convenient samples of patients or other um, preclinical models uh, with some collaborators here and uh, across our, our, our consortium. Uh, the second is with those technologies, uh, begin to look at their value, uh, clinical value in um, cohorts of patients that have by current standards you know, been uh, diagnosed with having some myofascial pain as their primary source of pain, and then hopefully develop a, uh, a, a study to look at the response to treatment and whether or not those tools allow us to better identify those patients who might respond to some of the traditional treatments that are used for patients with myofascial pain. And, and the kind of the ideas behind this are being driven with the uh, Connor and Wolf and some of the technologies brought to this through Roland and Chris Diederich, who's in radiation oncology. Another area that um, there's an identified uh, gap is in looking at social disparities or social determinants of back pain. And so we've been uh, building a group that uh, has a track record of exploring these issues. And SIREN, this Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network here at UCSF, is you know, I think a, a great partner for this. We've been working with Amelia DeMarchis, uh, Connor, and uh, uh, Sam Pack, and Tom Peterson, Patricia, and thinking about how we can um, explore, um, you know, vulnerable populations, uh, social determinants, both in access to care and response to treatment, uh, communication with with the medical system, and so some of the aims we're uh, we're building out are shown here. Uh, you know, starting with some existing data analyses, uh, communicating with patients. And here I think um, collaboration with our patient community engagement group is going to be valuable and then hopefully develop some pilot interventions. So the goal is to you know, start with some work, both for this ancillary project and then mechanism and the myofascial project, you know, generating some data uh, internally and then going to the data coordinating center to see if we can get additional funding to expand these efforts across the consortium. So the, uh, the, the, so the last thing I'll end with, so we have time for questions, is the goal here to leverage this infrastructure 
across the department. So you've kind of seen this slide before. This is um, an effort that's kind of grown out of our strategic plan. And uh, you know, one of the goals within that strategic plan is to enhance our infrastructure for clinical research. And so this figure uh, by design has lots of similarities to that figure that we saw earlier on in terms of backpack in the sense that we have an opportunity here to leverage the cores that are subsidized by backpack and have those cores be deployed to other clinical indications or groups across the department. And so Rochelle Palkowski is helping lead that effort. And we've already uh, you know, been working to make accessible biostatistical support as one of our primary or initial uh, um, kind of rollout resources. Uh, and, I, and we've been uh, you know, trying to socialize the, the opportunity here to work with Dennis Black and Tricia uh, for you know, analyzing existing data or working to generate proposals, the statistical design of those studies. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Tricia has been working to improve and build our clinical research coordinator infrastructure. Uh, we're uh, interviewing for a grant writer who can help prepare applications. And uh, Tom Peterson and his role in the informatics core is going to help us gen uh, kind of generalize those tools and, and uh, access to data to other groups and hopefully combine that with our prior investments in things like code. Um, and then uh, technology. So the both within the metric group that uh, Rich O'Donnell is leading and, and Jeannie's a part of in collaboration with physical therapy, the, you know, that technology group is uh, further subsidized by backpack. And so that I think this creates an opportunity for us to begin to deploy those technologies uh, in some um, you know, measured way in combination with the analytics to help then support the, the, you know, the clinical trials that uh, we, we, we uh, want to be you know, more competitive for, for uh, attracting and uh, more successful in conducting. So I'll, I'll stop here. I think that's, that's all I had planned to discuss, but I wanted to leave time for questions and, and uh, some thoughts about how we might better be able to uh, engage our department or our department's partners in this effort or in the effort to leverage this to other clinical groups. Great. Um, thanks so much. And it's uh, just so impressive the, um, the scope and the scale of everything that's, uh, that um, you and your group have been able to put together. And um, does anybody in the audience have questions? For also Connor, maybe you want to comment or Patricia or some of the others who are, you know, are, who are really putting a lot of effort into this who might want to add additional color. So that's happy to have that input too. Maybe Jeannie. I also see a hand up from Dr. Vale. I'll let, let the uh, investigators go ahead and make comments and then I'll, I'll have a question if there's time. Perfect. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> um, Connor here. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would have, obviously Jeff, that was a, a great overview of the whole project. I think the, um, the biggest challenge that I personally have, have seen with this is that our, our fund of knowledge about back pain is so limited. Um, there's so many different variables we would like to examine. Um, and you'd think with this you know, huge grant and, and all the resources available that we'd be able to do that, but it's, it's really difficult because of the, the, mainly the patient burden and, and secondarily the budget. So um, I think that's you know, probably been the, the biggest challenge that, that I've seen with this is just trying to uh, get all the, the data we need for deep phenotyping, but at the same time, um, you know, work within the practical constraints of scheduling and patient burden and, and budget. That's the only thing I'd have to add. Dr. Vail, did you wanna answer, ask a yeah. question? Yeah, I, mean, I just uh, first uh, congratulations on just a massive uh, effort um, and uh, comprehensive. Uh, the uh, the scope of it is uh, just it's staggering, really. Um, I have uh, two questions for you. One is a little bit of a silly one, and that is the NIH, this 
the U, the U19, the U24, the UG. Can you, can you explain to any of us what, what that means? And then uh, the, the more uh, practical question has to do with just recruiting patients. You um, mentioned the importance of socioeconomic determinants and reaching out into the community. Can you just illustrate for us uh, a, a patient's experience? So you're going to go out and you're going to recruit somebody. Uh, they're going to walk in the door. How do you decide if they get a sensor? How do you decide if they get a scan? How do you decide if they go down a, uh, one, one route or the other, or do they get all of the above? How, how would it work from a patient's perspective? Okay, great. Well, I'll touch upon the f first one briefly, and, and then I'll... Uh... Hunter and I can try to address a second, but so these different grant mechanisms are, you know, in part um, designed for differing levels of NIH involvement. So the, you know, the U mechanisms uh, different from a standard R01 where you, you know, write a grant, you get the, get the money, you do your research and you interact with your program officer maybe once a year with the progress report here, the U grants, it's really meant to be a active, collaboration with NIH program staff. So we have, uh, you know, a, a group of program officers who are, uh, you know, assigned to us. So we meet with them uh, monthly. There's a number of NIH program staff that are involved in all of these working groups and overall uh, organizational management. So it's a very hands-on uh, relationship. And so they're, um, you know, I think the goal, the, the, the message there is you have to be nimble and, and uh, you have to be a able to adapt and integrate NIH input as, as, uh, as the project evolves. And so I think they recognized that um, the you know, peer review process where grants are submitted and scored, they're needing to adhere to funding those projects that were well scored through study section, but then post the scoring, they wanted to look across those grants to identify synergies and collaborations and recognize that once the grants were funded, there's going to have to be a lot of work done to integrate um, across all of these centers so we're not in silos. And so that integration is a, a central theme and central component of what NIH program staff are hoping to help facilitate. And then in terms of the, the patient uh, piece, so we, uh, you know, we've been uh, the goal here and the reason we, we want both of our cohorts to be subjects that are part of UC Health, so they'll have already um, a footprint within the electronic health record data. And so one component of the strategy is to uh, collaborate with CTSI to uh, uh, study the electronic health record and identify patients who fit our inclusion exclusion criteria. And then we contact those patients and invite them to participate. So that's one avenue to try to get patients in the door. Tom Peterson has been kind of working to look at existing patients and how they might align with the different sites that we're, we have that will be recruiting and you know, how that might uh, represent some of the diversity issues and so forth. And then maybe, Connor, you can maybe talk a bit more about the, you know, the practical aspects of as patients come in, how we kind of expect the, that flow to happen. Yeah, so... Um... I mean, basically, the idea is that every patient, every subject gets every measure performed. Um, so that's that's the approach uh, we're taking. Um, there is some some precedent for that from uh, some other big uh, consortium type studies that have looked at pelvic pain, for example, and and uh, TMJ dysfunction, where patients get a huge battery of things, questionnaires. Uh, this technique called quantitative sensory testing, you know, functional MRI scans, et cetera. Um, the, the, the problem with that, of course, is that it's just a huge burden because every patient comes in, they basically spend the whole day. Uh, I mean, essentially, because particularly when, you know, they have to go to two separate MRI scanners because some of the sequences can be run on one uh, manufacturer's scanner and some sequence has to be run on another one. So the approach that, that at least one of the other MRICs is taking, which is Michigan, is to do the, uh, the sort of the, the advanced um, uh, measures such as you know, the time and money intensive MRI scans on a subset of patients. So the problem with that is it introduces bias, right? Because if you have, you're selecting patients beforehand, they're gonna get one study, you don't know if that is gonna influence the ultimate results. Um, 
it's a more pragmatic way to do it. Uh, and I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that we won't actually end up doing that to some degree. Um, but uh, if the idea would be to get everything on everybody. So that's our, that's our current plan. It's basically a full day. <laughs> they show up and <laughs> they're there till, you know, from morning till afternoon. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Drew, there are some questions on chat, I, I see. Yeah, so um, Dr. Lowe's, it looks like um, Dr. Beanie was asking um, for additional projects, um, how closely do they have to be tied to spine and low back pain? Well, the, so we have, um, I mean, there's the, 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 Projects that are related to you know patient engagement, to recruitment, um, retention, and some technologies that might facilitate that. Um, you know those could be more broadly available or applicable. You know the the ancillary. So there's projects that we originally proposed, and then there's these ancillary projects. We have a limited amount of money that we've been able to sequester internally to help support those, and then there's as I mentioned this larger. Um, amount of money that's within the data coordinating center. So the data coordinating center is currently developing their plan and process for how people access those dollars. And, you know, there's a committee, as you might imagine, that's looking at what priorities and, and how much money and, and how to, what the proposal process is going to be like. And so that we hope to be, once that gets established, you know, we have some insight because we're part of these committees on what the current thinking is on the gap areas and that's why we've been putting some energy in those two that I showed you because those seem to address those gaps. So, so there will be um, a specific, a formal request for proposals that comes out through the data coordinating center. And so we'll obviously be socializing, socializing that internally and to the extent that we can be creative about, you know, what we think we can make a case for, uh, you know, I think we should, you know, those are obviously that's money that's on the table and it's going to be limited to backpack investigators. So it's a fairly small uh, group of people will be applying. So I, so I'm happy to, to discuss and collaborate. We've been trying to, uh, you know, we have a weekly leadership meeting and we've been, um, you know, having some of our faculty present ideas they have at that meeting to get some internal feedback on. Does this look like it could be something? So those of you who have ideas that, you know, relate to not only the you know, concept of back pain, but perhaps some of the technologies that are related to the cores, you know, feel free to contact me or Desba, we can, you know, schedule a time to meet with a larger group. Great, and then also, uh, yeah, Jeff, stick here with a question. Um, Jeff, the, the enrollment is, is highly oriented towards the back home cohort, and I think a lot of the familiarity we've all developed now with some digital health techniques is going to help with uh, enrolling that back home cohort. What are your thoughts about? Um, Given our restrictions right now and some patient access, do you think the back home cohort is going to perhaps uh, enroll faster, maybe even complete earlier than the comeback cohort? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great point, Sagan. Yeah, that's obviously a, a strength that and a unique feature that we have across. I mean, we're the only uh, site that has a digital cohort planned. So I think that's uh, been an aspiration that that can be a much quicker. Uh, a start and, and hopefully allow us to access a large number of patients from the get-go. Now we, you know, the practical piece of that is we've, we're working with Eureka to build that platform so that, you know, there's uh, work they've done with Healthy Heart and others where there's, you know, infrastructure, uh, but you know, it takes time to build that and uh, we're working on IRB approval and all those things. So I think our hope is now that digital cohort will be ready to start enrolling in kind of the July, August timeframe, I think is the, our current target, but uh, but I do. Yeah, you're right. I think that that's going to be a unique opportunity for us. And so, to the extent that we can, um, you know, be thinking creatively about how we want to leverage that, um, you know, we're all, I'm happy with, to, to get your thoughts. You know, another area I'll make a pitch for is the CDMI. So another uh, opportunity for us is to you know that these technologies, particularly data access to data for analysis, is something that. I want to uh, see if we can get some ad additional support through the CDMI to uh, pay for additional studies. And one, uh, you know, Sig, I know I've been working with you and others in your group about looking at economics uh, of back pain and economic analyses. And there's some uh, groups developing treatment, back pain treatments that 
uh, really interested in that. So I think that we, as we think about others who can be attracted to us uh, because of this infrastructure and then some other clever ways to uh, support studies that, um, uh, you know, decorate the perimeter of backpack, you know, that's a, an opportunity I think we all should be, able to be trying to take advantage of. Great, thanks. Any other questions from the audience? I think one other quick one from Dr. Beanie was um, the, could you go um, over the time frame for completion of the project? Yeah, the, uh, yeah, our, our goal, I mean, obviously we were going to be behind schedule. Um, we, our ho original hope was we'd be enrolling patients by now um, or shortly. So, but, but also this, we have this constraint that we've got to be done in five years or plus or minus. So we're, uh, you know, ratcheting back a little bit the follow-up timeline. Uh, we're wanting to be aggressive with uh, some of the existing data analyses now because we have a little bit more flexibility there. But we hope to start enrolling the in the the uh, in clinic cohort in the the fall and and hope to have three years worth of data. There's going to be obviously a, a lot of effort in aggregating data. Uh, near the end of that time frame, uh, but this interventional trial that that's additional money within the uh, backpack to support, I think, is really meant to take learnings from these convenient or these observational or the interventional study in Michigan and build those into a new study. So the timing of that uh, interventional trial, uh, you know, it hasn't been established. The thinking is like starting in three years, so we have some time to follow these patients and look at response to treatment. So that's going to be, I think, the central. Thing we'll be targeting as our uh, uh, way of demonstrating these algorithms that we're working to develop actually have utility and hopefully you know that's going to be done in sufficient time to um, have a large enough sample that we can uh, conclude something at the end of this and there may be opportunities for additional money coming into this program that we can extend beyond that five years so there's been some discussion about uh, this might not be just a one and done kind of a thing and that there could be uh, follow-on programs that are funded uh, perhaps through similar mechanisms after the five years of backpack. Great. Thanks so much. It's um, right at 8.30, so I think we'll plan to wrap up there. But um, Dr. Lotz, thanks again for presenting. This was really uh, informative, exciting, um, and um, very impressive. And um, thank you all for uh, joining and look to- Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, sir.